upon a certain day in the month of May, when I had occupied my mind with various tasks, desiring distraction such as one seeks in springtime, I did pass by places most delicious and agreeable to the sight. Having long admired this great work of nature, laying myself down on the green sward, I was overcome by a profound sleep, and this was followed by a dream. In this it came to me that I was on the heights of a mountain most difficult to access, wherein a goodly father hermit, a soul most learned in all sciences, had for a long time made his abode and habitation, and having approached myself to it, I did perceive this venerable sage, who stepped out and in that instant did see me. Having offered my salutations, he proceeded to inquire by what route I had come here, it being well nigh inaccessible. I said that the helpful God had led me there, considering the fact that, because of the dangers involved, very few had approached him throughout many long years, though many had set forth to do so. And having answered that all stemmed from divine bounty, he proved most favourable toward me, and undertaking that no peril had had the power to divert me for the goodly toil I had made as regards his doctrine and his person. This laid him under obligation to receive me most favourably and explain unto me manifold subjects, among which was what had moved him to take up that extraordinary abode, which was nothing but the same curiosity I myself had, where he alone remained with seven in that place and in others circumjacent, and despising all worldly goods and fortune, had passed their long years, even unto two centuries, entire in most perfect health. But in that I was right wearied by the distance I had travelled in visiting this place, and assailed by the extraordinary hunger and thirst, which was far more, considering that there was no way whereby victuals might be produced. And I saw no manner whereby I might make some seemly retreat into this extremity, but I would incur some measure of disgrace, coupled with the difficulty of the route, and the time I would need to arrive at the small hamlet which nestled at the foot of the mountain, inhabited by two or three persons, of a condition so mercenary that they abandoned not only their health, but their lives in the labour they performed in that place. I knew not to which saint I should commend myself, for the fear I had that I would there make my cemetery. This the good ancient apprised, and spoke to me as follows. My son, be without fear, for all goodness stirs me to give thee all that is within my power, and you shall find here that with which to assuage your curiosity, which did stir thee to undertake so high an enterprise, and I shall lead thee to see things worthy of great admiration. These words seemed to me so sweet and agreeable that I thought no more on hunger and thirst, so well that, having entered his chambers, I began to see a sight right darksome and unpleasant, which knew no daylight but through a skylight which I espied in the midst of the vault. This encouraged one to have always to hand a bright lamp, because of the numerous detours disposed for entrance, within which were to be found a quantity of ladders used for that end, thus to avoid the disgrace one might incur there. Its furnishing was rude, made of a metallic thing, which glistened to the sight like small stars. The place wherein he took repose was cut into the rock and was most impressive, for a child of Saturn had there been born. However, these things did not prevent in the least the memory which was returned to me of so great a hunger and thirst, so much so that the good father hermit 
recognising this, knelt down, making his prayers. He no sooner completed this than I espied a bird enter at the skylight, far exceeding all others in size, bearing a strong resemblance to an eagle, which held in its beak that which would suffice, not only for its own food, but more than sufficient to sustain us. This bird he named his provider, which since his solitary sojourn had ever aided him with all things he might have need of. While taking our refection, he spoke with me of great matters, amongst others the effects of nature, whereupon he said he had passed the greater part of his study in this place, which was the first abode of Hermes Trismegistus, father of philosophers, in whom was the source of his most hidden secrets. His discourse and speech was so diverting that the time hung not on my hands, joined to which the recital he had made to me of the gentleness and rarity of the abodes of those whom cruel death had taken from him, whom he regretted very strongly. The dinner being over, and curious to view these, I requested he accord me that, and forthwith he caused me to enter into the first abode, in the middle of which was descried a pillar of bronze, wherein we regarded a niche upon which was represented in sculpture the figure of an ancient, large as life, robed in black, holding in his right hand a scythe, and with the other a tablet with an ebony frame. On this was painted a corpse, upon which were ranged diverse vessels, disposed to take earth in a place that seemed to me right monstrous. All was compassed about by the sea, and to enter into this there were three great arches, beneath which one must pass, of most difficult approach, fashioned of diverse orders. It was well to know, inasmuch as the one of these was favourable to navigation. The other greatly distanced the voyager from his straight road, and the other so perilous that none might approach it with mishap and wreck. This sea produced a black sand. In the second abode, the day appeared very strong and pleasant, and there was represented a man robed in red, holding in his right hand a sword, and in the other a square tablet, the colour of cinnabar, upon which was depicted a golden fleece, that the good father hermit said could not be had but with great pains, labour and industry. The floor of this abode was covered over with a sand, swarthy in colour. In the third was represented the figure of a woman in relief, robed in a gown of green, it seemed to me the goddess of spring, holding in her hand a tablet of opal colour, whereon was depicted an hermaphrodite. The floor of this abode was covered over with a sand of changing colour. In the fourth was figured an amphitheatre, upon which was seated the figure of a man, robed in a long mantle of cloth of gold lined with ermine, holding in his right hand a sceptre. Above his head was a disc filled with small suns, and at the highest point of this amphitheatre was a great tablet framed in burnished gold, upon which was depicted the most beauteous figures and rich inventions of Philostrates. The floor of this abode was covered over with a sand, in no way yellowish, but seeming brilliant, like unto flecks of gold. In the principal part of the fifth abode was represented a throne, upon which was seated a young girl robed in a white gown, holding in her hand a crescent, and at the limits of this throne there was a tablet with a silver frame, whereupon also was depicted a great fountain, which casted forth two liquors, one white and the other red. Within the depths of this appeared a red-coloured sand. 
In the sixth abode was a sight most extraordinary, which seemed lit by a quantity of torches, which turned about and whirled a concourse of moths finally to immolate themselves. In the midst of this, upon a small pilaster, was a youth, robed in taffeta of ever-changing colour, holding in his hand a caduceus. And all about this abode were diverse tableaux, framed in various colours, upon which were represented processions and other figures or devotions, which seemed to me to be an imitation of those I had formerly seen at the Cemetery of the Holy Innocents in Paris. This obliged me to make my prayer, as this place seemed to me very devotional. But, as it seemed to the good Father Hermit, somewhat overlong and uninteresting, informed me that it was unnecessary that I tarry longer. More so, because in the final abode, he hoped to reveal to me all that my curiosity might wish for, and to explain to me that which I had here seen. So curious was I to learn, although my spirit was far from penetrating it, we were beside a small mountain close enough to this place. The entrance to this, by a gate ennobled with a multitude of precious stones, and which very few beside him might open, the entrance to this was by a gate ennobled with a multitude of precious stones, and which very few besides him might open, had they not the true key. Above this was a slate-coloured marble, on which were written some words. And having opened this last gate, we entered into a comely and agreeable abode, within which were set diverse tableaux which he said were the creation of Apuleius, Conrath, the Cosmopolite, Polyphilus and others, filled with things worthy of admiration, and he made to me ample discourse as to their signification. In the midst of this abode was a rock, from which came forth two serpents, one winged and the other not, and upon this rock was an hermaphrodite, holding a globe which fell into four parts, which were to signify the four elements, and joining together again, rendered them confused and mixed together, which could then be set apart. About this abode were represented the figures I had seen before, which were life-size sculptures, which by their movement from the artist and industry, from the goodly father hermit, seemed disposed to dance a ballet, the which I esteemed to be the dance of the gods. Attached to this rock was a column very high, about which were engraved in letters of gold these words. Empty if that. And below, in letters of silver, what follows as to the order of the characters in the ballet. Saturn first in virility, shall inaugurate the dance. Jupiter follows after, for to imitate his prance. Mars, both great and bellicose, will give to it cadence. A sun in due order shall have his walk on part. Venus, fine-robed, who from dancing cannot keep herself apart, this strange Mercury would detest. Were it not that soon after the moon appeared next, causing the entire ballet to possess its movement. Pausing to read and consider these writings, that I might comprehend their sense, I espied on the instant that the two serpents were approaching me, one of them shooting forth flames of fire by its maw, and the other a liquor so foul and stinking that I was constrained to quit the place immediately. But the good father Hermit, following me in order to say his adieus, as a mark of his good will, gave me a present of a small volume of his own composition, from whence I have drawn and extracted all this discourse and that which follows, and which explained from word to word 
that which he had caused me to see. And in a small container inside this, he professed, was a powder beyond all price. Wishing to thank him for such bounty, I found myself that very instant deprived of his company, and being in greater difficulty than ever, in that I knew not in which place I was, I had recourse to prayer. Which being granted, I discovered that this place was not far removed from my ordinary dwelling, of which I was much rejoiced. Such joy, however, was to be of short duration, in that shortly after, I found myself invested by several persons laying claim to being grand philosophers. That we term in these days souffleurs or puffers, whom I believe disposed to take from me the gift which had been given me, especially inasmuch as they conversed very familiarly on the whole natural philosophy and its operations, arguing most diversely concerning it. These taking me to be one of their cabal, from the which I was very distanced, having held ever their propositions in horror, begged me to give my opinion upon their ideas. Having excused myself from this as much as possible, none the less, by their importunity, imagining themselves by my discourse expert in this science, I was constrained to speak my mind, which obliged me to make them the following discourse. Albeit, the philosophers of old have well enough set to writing the admirable secret of the power of both art and nature, bringing to light this rich fleece or universal medicine, and though many have set about searching it out, the greater part of these have found but little fruit. There being few among them who might truly say that they have well understood their intentions, even less their subject and operations, which surpass the common mind, having been writ only for those who have the true and perfect understanding, without the aid of which it is difficult to come to this art. Nonetheless, that which I spoke to them was not designed to divert them, nor their curiosity, which I cherish most highly, but to prevent the waste of time and goods they might there probably consume, recognising by their contrariness that they were very far from the goal of their intentions. Added to which the fact that they here undertook affairs, both great and difficult, without the least principle. This discourse ended Certain of them gleamed the better part of this advice and thanked me. Others cursed me, claiming I'd removed from them all hope, regretting the great expense they had incurred there. Among the rest was a Saturnine fellow who claimed himself to be a great philosopher and a doctor of medicine of the third degree, who, not content with the maledictions he had addressed me, called me a wily dreamer, and wished that I would fall into a dream that should prove as irritating to me, if not more so, than my discourse had proved to them. This wish was no sooner made than it was accomplished, and I forthwith commenced to dream. I found myself again in an unknown land, where there were mountains, though not so high as those aforementioned, and entering fortuitously within one of these, it seemed to me that I perceived, not without great apprehension, its entrails being searched and burrowed into, considering the depth and obscurity of the place, filled with diverse paths, streaming water in a most obnoxious a manner and difficult to hold to, had it not been by good fortune that I came across a man who offered to serve as a guide. He was armed with a goodly lamp, and the necessary equipment to penetrate such places, which he painted to me as truly dangerous. His company seemed to me most favourable, inasmuch as he claimed often to frequent the place where he showed me, being but little content of it, having heard tell of the peril that was in it. Some persons, who with mighty blows of the hammer, 
seemed fain to gradually beat this mountain down, knocking from it chips in great number, which were afterward transported to a hole which seemed to me disposed for this in the centre of the summit. And having descended into this, and begged the guide to show unto me the remainder of this place, he answered that my curiosity should be assuaged, inasmuch as we were now at a horrendous depth, incredible to many, and it was not his intention to go further. In this we were, soon after, impeded by means of a vapour or exhalation, which having started forth, rendered us senseless and without motion, though we came to our senses again a little after. I heard then my guide lamenting and making great clamour, for his lamp on falling had gone out, and he was beyond all hope of ever finding or relighting it. He said that my too great curiosity would be the cause of our loss, which was now inevitable. Wishing in some way to console him, although my terror was greater than his own, I conjured that he should have recourse to that helpful deity who was our true guide, praying him that he come to our aid and save us from that extremity. There fell then upon our ears a voice whose words were the following, I am he of whom you see aid. In that instant, there appeared a most effulgent luminosity, which I took for the lightning bolt hurled by Jupiter as punishment of my too great curiosity. By means of this, my guide recovered his lamp, which in his falling had fortuitously slid into a vein of this mountain, not too far distant from us, which was very brilliant. He began to strike his flint to relight it, giving thanks unto God giving thanks unto God for such good fortune. We made the promptest return possible, so much so that having quit this place and returned into safe harbour, I made protestation never to return there again. Fatigued by the long road and the trials endured there, we rested ourselves by a fountain close nearby, which was environed in all parts by a stone clear as crystal, in the depths of which was to be seen a gravel, most delicate, brown in colour. It seemed to me some hot vapours issuing from the earth or some subterranean fire did cause it to distill right mildly, and not of the order of other different fountains, at which I was greatly astonished. Above it, was a dome-like form, which did receive certain of the vapours, which transformed into a water most clear and bright, carried by a small channel to a site close by. This fountain, my guide informed me, was of very great virtue, and proper to many things. Inquiring of him if that water remained continually where the channel did bring it, he answered me, no, but that it was carried thence and cast back upon the place from whence it was taken, and this was reiterated several and many times. To conclude, this fountain had the power to produce and bring to light of day a seed beyond all price, linked by marvellous links, which did accumulate all about that dome. The inhabitants of the place held that it proceeded from the forges of Vulcan, which they believe were beneath this fountain, from whence came forth a constant fire, which administered itself, now with a moderate fire, in imitation of nature, now with a vehement long-continuing heat, which appeared to try to transform the fountain entirely into fire. It had the power to transform itself into a furnace, in which appeared several openings, wherein were collocated several vessels of glass, which endured very readily the rigours of the fire, in which were various concoctions unknown to me. Wishing to know what was within this, I began to smell a very strong odour, and applying my tongue to taste it, found a bitter humour, which the guide informed me, 
stem from the continual heat and Herculean labour, which caused me to deem that the smith god would have need of faithful company and long labour to undertake the burden of such work. Moreover, I saw there a seed, which at first very hard and solid became humid, which one might freely dispose in the depths of a very narrow vessel, that the heat penetrating it may be carried throughout. To this was added a quantity of the water from that fountain, which was very scrupulously guarded, more so inasmuch as it oft distilled never so well as when those two vessels were joined mouth to mouth, placing them above a hollowed oak within a chimneyed furnace, beneath which is set a constant and continual fire, which makes appear a variety of colours, which after forty days' space change all into a colour black and dark, followed next by white, then further to an iris or rainbow, a sight very fair to see because of the diversity of its colours. I was advised by the guide that the occult heat was never allowed to cease when the seed was in the vessel, but that, on the contrary, with great labour was this continuous fire attended, and that from day to day the colours were seen, little by little, to diminish, and to dispose themselves to take again the colour of white, this by means of a heat similar to that whereby the hen hatches forth her chicks. Although such things seem to my sight very pleasant and agreeable, they might well have become an ennui to me because of the long space of time I had passed in regarding them, which is approaching now to a year. Had it not been that having seen the whiteness start to appear, I became curious as to the end, which having come, brought forth a powder of the most extraordinary white. And breaking this vessel, for to ascertain if it be not a false colour, I recognised that my goodly father Hermit had told the truth, and carefully taking this, I made present of a small part of it to the god Mercury, who received it very willingly, and who, enraptured of its pleasant smell, did straight away start to taste it after strange happenstance, having first expelled from his body diverse vapours, and disposed as he was, assumed a nature so heavy and solid that he could no longer stir as he had done before. He was greatly indignant of this, protesting that he would avenge himself on me the disgrace he had received of this so grievous a present and commencing to sink into the great noise he made, that I might flee in the face of his wrath. I was restrained from this by that guide, who told me I should not fear him, for he was very well stopped up and could no longer move as he had heretofore. I was in extreme error, for I had so soon taken out this powder, in view of the fact that he had wished to show me a thing more excellent by far, and that it were necessary to leave it in place from whence it had been taken, and by means of fire, to lead it to the colour of a red most perfect, taking care to maintain the heat applied there continually, without diminution, but on the contrary, to continuously augment it with discretion and in such manner that the hand might easily suffer it. Then, should we witness this whiteness take on the colour of saffron, which would change into diverse other hues, concluding with the colour red, like unto hyacinth, and finally of a permanent purplish ruby, then titled elixir, and serve for diverse things. These he would not express, were it not that it kept all persons in perfect health throughout long years were one from time to time to take a grain's worth in weight in a little wine or other liquor. Furthermore, I should bear in mind that just as I had seen the entrails of the earth moistened by a water trickling through this mountain, similarly did this seed seek to be moistened with the water of that fountain 
when it were known that it needed this. I complained that the time I had passed at this work had produced for me but a negligible quantity of this elixir. My guide informed me that it could be easily augmented at will by means of the first water of that fountain, and of a sort most common, having only to refresh it diverse times, that the fire was the conductor of this working, which was achieved in but little time. And finishing his discourse, commending me to God, in a thunderous voice, I began to arise from my reverie and the profound sleep in which I was held, such that, smiling to myself of so pleasant a dream, and opening my eyes, it seemed to me I was in a new world, and that the premises of my dwelling were painted and enriched in gold and silver. And so greatly satisfied with that, I remembered having witnessed in my dream reverie, I resolved to visit my friends and companions, and spend the rest of my days with them. When I had made recitation to them of what had passed, they obliged me to compose this little discourse, to share it with dreamers and visionaries such as myself, and to such as would set themselves to explicate so gentle a vision, bring contentment of mind, and draw from it such fruit as they desire their most humble servant.' 